This is your last lecture, um, looking at just some kind of ending foreign policy stuff that might pop up on, on the um, AP test, mostly taking place in the 90s, but definitely show some themes and concerns that continue, continue into foreign policy questions and issues in the early 2000s um, and even today. So um, again, we finished off a unit ago with the, the Cold War, and remember that Starting with like the the Carter Doctrine, um, a lot of the shift in the worry about the Cold War had moved to the Middle East with Afghanistan, Iran, etc. Um, and that, that that concern will continue into the 90s and obviously explode in the 2000s. So we're going to look really quickly at the Persian Gulf War. This is probably the only one that might show up on the AP test. I've seen it come up once or twice as a multiple choice question. All of these things could definitely be things you tie into for the synthesis, especially if there's any question about kind of modern foreign policy, Cold War, etc. Um, all right, so the reason, so each, each of these categories or events will have the reason the U.S. was concerned or got involved, what actions, if any, the U.S. took, and kind of the result. The grade column is for you just to kind of think on your own, like, how well were we doing as the kind of main superpower. At this point, Russia is kind of regrouping. Remember that Gorbachev, they had gone through a restructuring of their economy and their political system. And so the U.S. is really kind of seen as the global cop that is supposed to intervene in a lot of these different crises. And you'll see in some we intervene very well and some we don't do as well. So um, first one, Persian Gulf War. The reason we got involved is that Saddam Hussein of Iraq had invaded Kuwait in 1990. Um, and ignored the UN. So first, all, a lot of the actions started with the United Nations. Um, we'll see that we move away from using the United Nations towards the end of the 90s and into 2000s. But um, a lot of these actions, one theme is that we are working with the international organizations um, and their structures. So again, the United Nations tells Saddam Hussein to get out of Kuwait. He ignores it. Um, the reason he had invaded Kuwait, a couple reasons. One is that he accused Kuwait of, you can kind of see on this map, little Kuwait, that they were siphoning oil off of um, Iraqi pipelines right along the border. Another is kind of going, and this would be a great synthesis, is going all the way back to the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. He claimed that um, the lines that were drawn, that Kuwait wasn't actually, it shouldn't be its own country, wasn't its a real state, and that it should be rightfully part of Iraq. So again, all those were reasons why he invaded. Um, and the U.S. took pretty swift action. So within less than a week, we had already sent some kind of limited um, air force deployments. Operation Desert Storm doesn't, doesn't start until, the, um, until later, later into the fall of that year. Um, but right away, we are concerned in planning, planning action. Um, and so again, that the main action was called Operation Desert Storm. Um, and mostly Operation Desert Storm, you can kind of see here, a lot of our fight there was supposed to be a very limited war. Um, and it was very, very fast. It lasted 42 days. Um, was mostly airstrikes. There were some ground operations. But again, it was heavily relied upon um, very targeted airstrikes on critical um, Iraqi kind of resources, strongholds, military um, tactical sites, and things like that. One note is that that operation um, had the support of the UN, so the UN authorized that, um, that activity. We, um, there was a coalition force that was involved in that, so NATO um, and the Arab League were behind us in this action, were supporting and also providing resources and military, um, so that in the Persian Gulf War, one lesson is that, again, we relied upon international organizations. We had an international coalition of support, um, and it was very rapid. And again, the end game was very clear in that war. Like they, the entry and end goals were very clear. There was no, and the, the result is Saddam Hussein did leave Iraq, um, but Saddam Hussein himself was not removed as a leader. And some people criticize this. Um, had we gone fully in to remove him as a leader at that time, we might have been stuck in a much longer war, as we've seen with the uh, more modern Iraq war. Um, and you'll see that Saddam Hussein pops up several more times in the 90s as a problem, and then obviously leading into the 2003 Iraq war. So again, 
Um, very rapid war, very short, very targeted with an international coalition. So you kind of decide, like, um, was this a just war? Was it correctly fought? Was this an intervention that we needed to do? Um, kind of the long-lasting result is that America um, felt really proud of this. Again, it was a really fast war, uh, limited U.S. casualties, um, and so they were feeling really good about our military abilities post-Cold War, and that kind of hubris will then um, play into our involvement in some other places um, and maybe come back to backfire on us. So the next big event is the civil war in Somalia. So this war had been going on. It was kind of an inter-clan civil war, um, but the humanitarian reach of it was so bad that we are going to get involved with the United Nations. Um, so reason we got involved is, again, this civil war, and that civil war had caused widespread famine and starvation to the point that the U.S. Um, and the international community was called upon to respond and provide. So our actions were to help um, support um, Operation Provide Relief and then Operation Restore Hope with the United Nations. So we were providing military support, some intelligence for helping to deliver aid. And so this was a much different kind of operation than, say, Operation Desert Storm, where, again, we were just trying to be there to make sure that food and other aid could be delivered. Um, the Battle of Mogadishu, the results of that you can see in this famous picture, if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, um, was kind of the battle that everyone remembers from Somalia and has long-lasting um, effects on our foreign policy for years to come. And that battle is where Americans on their televisions in their living rooms were watching American uh, military forces being dragged through brutally hacked with machetes and things like that through the streets of Mogadishu. And again, 34 Americans died there, um, which was really confusing to Americans be as they're watching this literally happen on the news live um, because we understood that we were there to provide food and aid. This wasn't some kind of military operation where we were fighting um, something like Saddam Hussein's forces. Like, we were there to provide aid, and yet our military men were being brutally attacked, helicopters burned out um, just horrifically on the streets of Mogadishu. Um, so the long-lasting result of this, and we'll see that when genocide and other humanitarian disasters come up in the 90s and even today, um, is that Americans are much less willing to support sending in the U.S. military to help in some of these countries, especially um, those in Africa, um, for fear that, again, even when providing something like food and aid, that they would be, that American military people would be killed. So again, it makes us, so Persian Gulf War gives us this, like, we're strong, we're good, we're doing really well, and then just a few years later, this Battle of Mogadishu happens, and Americans are like, whoa, what are we doing? And they kind of retreat into this somewhat isolationism of like, what are we, why are we involved in this civil war? Why is this our problem? What are we doing here? We'll come back to that in a little bit. Other big um, economic international event um, in 94, again, this one sometimes comes up, is NAFTA. NAFTA is in North... Um, Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, the reason we signed this between Canada um, and Mexico, and us obviously, um, is that we wanted to promote free trade between the three countries. What this did is it got rid of most of the tariffs um, on products, so like say we're importing agricultural products, there would be a tariff on that prior to NAFTA, um, a tax, right, an import tax. And so the Na NAFTA has gotten rid of most of those tariffs. There are still a few. A lot of those tariffs focused on agricultural products, automobiles, et cetera. Um, 2008 is when those the final tariffs got lifted. So it took over, um, over a decade for all of those tariffs to kind of be phased out. Um, and again, the actions were lifting tariffs on products coming from um, Mexico and Canada. Um, the results are less clear and conclusive, so there are people that argue, and you've even heard Bernie Sanders talking about NAFTA, um, some people argue that um, it had a negligible effect, positive effect on the economy, some um, play up the fears about job loss and that it actually had a negative effect, so again, the conclusive results are, are unclear, 
Um, a lot of labor unions like the AFL-CIO are very much against it because NAFTA did not build in any protections for, for labor, um, which is why you'll see a lot of them speaking out against it. Um, a lot of the job loss that was feared that all of a sudden all these American companies would go down to Mexico, most of those fears were not realized. Um, the economies in all three countries kind of, again, negligibly, negligibly got better, but it's hard to correlate that directly to NAFTA. So again, um, there haven't been kind of strong, conclusive things that NAFTA was worth it, but there also have been strong kind of negative effects. And again, this is something that's still debated today. All right, moving on to Rwanda. So again, we're talking a year after the Battle of Mogadishu, another country. Um, so you've got Somalia over here um, and then little Rwanda here. Um, Rwanda in a similar kind of internal strife. If you have seen Hotel Rwanda or study this in maybe world history, um, you'll remember that there was a widespread genocide committed by the Hutus against the Tutsis. Um, the Hutus blamed the Tutsis for many of Rwanda's social and economic problems. They also blamed Tutsis for shooting down the president's plane. Um, and so this very deliberate, very open course of, of genocide starting in April of 94 began against the Tutsis and intelligence was very clear. Um, the Freedom of Information Act has re uh, released all of these documents um, maybe about 10 years ago that demonstrated that President Clinton, Vice President Gore, um, Secretary of State, etc., were all very well aware of what was happening, um, but refused to call it a genocide. Like the, privately, they would actually speak of it as a genocide, but would not publicly state that it was genocide. So our actions were very delayed because, again, a year before this, the Battle of Mogadishu and American GIs being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu brutally uh, were in the minds of both the government. Um, and the American people. And so no one was very excited about sending American troops to go stop this genocide, but everyone was very well aware that this was happening, um, and it was truly horrific, as you've seen in, in many movies, I'm sure, in world history. So again, our actions were delayed. We do eventually come in, um, again, with the United Nations to provide relief, um, but the result is that we were heavily criticized, along with um, France and Belgium and the United Nations, for our slow reaction. Clinton had, had frequently had to apologize for um, denying that was publicly denying that it was a genocide and, and being so slow. But again, the question is, if we had immediately taken action, would the American people have been behind it? because again, the memories of Somalia were very fresh and very raw for Americans. So again, delayed. Had we been able to act faster with Belgium and France and the United Nations? And the other question is, was this our problem? Um, yes, it was a huge humanitarian disaster, but many Americans asked at that time, like, how many countries do we need to intervene in to help save? And again, there's just this struggle in the 90s of, what is our role as this main superpower of the world? Like, are we supposed to go in and save everyone? Do we have the resources to do that? Um, and are we even welcome in all of these countries? So again, this, that is another theme that will continually play out through the 90s and into 2000s. Um, so with that criticism for the delayed response in Rwanda, um, comes the next kind of humanitarian disaster and genocide is the war in Kosovo. Um, which was part of Serbia at the time. Um, tensions there had begun in 92 um, with war in Bosnia, Milosevic coming to power. Um, the reason that we get involved is, again, there begins to be these attacks on Muslim Kosovars, and again, this very evident evidence of of genocide again. And there's this, from 92 to 98, there's this constant... Um, struggle of how to stop Milosevic, stop the Serbian attacks on Kosovars, um, and what the U.S. response will be. Um, some of that, our actions to go in um, and support militarily in 99 um, were, so in like 98, 98, early 99, um, 
Bill Clinton was heavily um, distracted by a couple things. One, the whole Monica Lewinsky scandal was going on and fears of impeachment. Um, so that was weighing heavily upon him. At the same time, remember Saddam Hussein back from the Persian Gulf War, um, he had agreed at the end of the Persian Gulf War to have weapons inspectors um, come in to make sure they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. In 1998, he kicks those weapons inspectors out um, and does not allow any more inspections to happen, which raises concerns. And then also two of our embassies were bombed in Africa by Osama bin Laden. So al-Qaeda has popped up on the scene. So again... Um, Part of Clinton is worried, all right, if I ignore another genocide, um, I'll be again criticized like I was for Rwanda. But he's also distracted by bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, these growing concerns with those two, um, and then obviously the whole Monica Lewinsky scandal. So he's, he's greatly divided on what the U.S. is going to do. Again, there's this call that the U.S. must take action. This is another civil war like Somalia, like Rwanda, where a huge humanitarian disaster and America is, again, these concerns. What is a difference that is another theme is that Somalia, Rwanda are in Africa. Because these are European, some people criticize that Americans acted faster because it was a European humanitarian disaster, um, and thus some of those kind of racist images fall in where we're much more likely to intervene um, when it is white people involved in a humanitarian disaster rather than um, African citizens of Somalia or Kosovo. So again, there were those criticisms. Ultimately, in 99, again, with a coalition force with NATO, um, again, using the tactic like in Persian Gulf War, heavily airstrike um, focused, we were able to come in um, and put an end to that, the civil war and the um, genocide of Kosovars there. Um, result is that civil war died down, Again, we felt really good because this was another example of a success um, after the two big failures of Rwanda and Somalia. Um, and a lot of those tensions in that region have, have died down since that humanitarian disaster um, was dealt with fairly successfully. The other big issue that we haven't talked about yet um, in the 90s and then leading into the 2000s is nuclear non-proliferation becomes kind of another huge topic because of some changes. So the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was written in 1968, came into um, being and enforcement in 1970. Um, the reason we start becoming concerned again about this um, is that in the late 90s, um, India and Pakistan both tested nuclear devices. Um, and so there was this growing concern that um, on that subcontinent that there would be some kind of nuclear warfare. Uh, they were both, they both did not sign the treaty. Israel, Israel as well also did not sign it, but they do not openly admit to having them. Um, and then in the early 2000s, North Korea, that had been a signatory to the non-proliferation non treaty, pulled out in 2003. And so again, um, where things had been going pretty well with the, the signature, the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and then a nuclear test ban treaty that many, most countries signed that um, possessed nuclear weapons, that was all progress. And then things fall ap apart between India and Pakistan, fears of a nuclear war there. And then obviously North Korea until today, just a few months ago, right, their claims of having shot off a hydrogen bomb. Um, that fear has grown. And then the other big fear is with Pakistan having done its nuclear tests, um, the growing fear with nuclear proliferation is Pakistan has openly sold nuclear weapons technology um, to Iran, to terrorist groups, etc. And so the fear now is that the nuclear non-proliferation treaty will become kind of a moot point because um, terrorist groups that are, do not have to abide by a treaty, are not impacted by it, will get their hands on um, some kind of nuclear technology and will be able to do something like a dirty bomb or something like that. And so again, all these events in the 90s demonstrate some of the long-term concerns that we still have today. So um, that is it for this lecture. <laughs>